topic of this video is fairly straightforward, but also very important. What is inflation and why does it matter? So, what is inflation? A sustained increase in the general level of prices for goods, that's stuff you can kick like cars, and services. So financial services, for example, there's the BBC definition, and that'll do nicely. Why do investors monitor the level of inflation quite so closely? Well, that's what I want to look at in this video. Now, how's it measured? It's usually quoted in headlines and on research reports as an annual percentage change, 1.2% for argument's sake. There are two measures, and that's where the confusion starts to set in that are commonly quoted in the UK, and this is a UK-focused video. One is the Consumer Prices Index, the CPI, and that hasn't been around as long as the more traditional method, the Retail Prices Index, or RPI. Okay, I'll explain why there are two measures and some of the differences between them in just a moment. Bear in mind there are two. Usually the CPI is known as the headline number, all right, and that's the one that the Bank of England pays the closest attention to when setting interest rates. But the RPI was, until the CPI replaced it, the UK's standard measure of inflation. Both are based on changes in the value of a basket of goods and services. The point is nobody can physically track what's happening to the price of every single good and service that's produced in the UK. So naturally enough, the government, who put this number together, take a kind of sampling approach. But it's quite a hefty sample. So how do they do it? Imagine you had a basket on the floor and you decided that 700 items, you can't do them all, so 700, that's quite a few items consumed by a typical UK household, will go in that basket. The idea is shove them in the basket, all right, or wait a while, re-measure the value of the items in the basket, taking account of what families tend to spend on each item. So for example, a typical family will spend more on fuel for the car than it will on postage stamps, for example. So you can weight the items, come up with an index and monitor the change in the value of that index up or down. All right, as the value of those 700 items increases, inflation, if the value of the 700 items were to decrease, deflation, so fairly critical, you pick representative items Otherwise, the basket could be completely meaningless in terms of what it tells you about the rest of the economy. So, the Office for National Statistics, that's part of the government, all right, look at 700 items, taking around 180,000 different price quotations from all around the country, all right, and then weight, as I mentioned, each item in the basket according to its relative importance in expenditure terms. So, pretty hefty exercise. Now, just to give you a flavour for the work involved, clearly what a UK family consumes will vary. It will change. All right? So, for example, in 2014, certain things came into the basket and certain things dropped out. Now, just for pure interest's sake, honey, men's clothing hire, certain types of car wash and plant food came in, and tufted carpets, DVD recorders, hardwood flooring, which took a battering all right, in the last recession and downturn, and wallpaper paste went out. So the point being, they're trying their best to make this basket of items as representative as possible of what's going on in the UK economy in terms of what people are buying and consuming. Now, what are the key differences between the two measures? I mean, if, why can't you just have one basket and sort of get on with it and produce a measure of inflation based on that one basket? Well, there are two measures and they're both quoted, so some key differences. First of all, the Retail Prices Index includes some key housing costs, and one of them is mortgage interest payments, one or two others besides, the CPI doesn't. Now, why did the CPI, which came later, take out things like mortgage interest payments? Well, the logic's supposed to be this. One of the key uses for this data is setting the bank rate of interest. One of the key things that bank rate of interest influences is the cost of your mortgage. So, CPI fans say you don't want mortgage costs in the basket because you get a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. All right, because if you change the bank rate, you also change your mortgage rate, which drags the price of the basket down. So the logic of the CPI is dump those costs and look at what's happening to the price of everything else, all right, and then try and determine the bank rate accordingly. CPI also takes account of the fact that people do change their spending habits. So if something gets expensive, you don't just stop buying it or using it, you'll tend to switch to something else. And in a modern economy, don't forget CPI is the newer measure, that is increasingly straightforward, that product substitution that goes on. And the CPI uses a different calculation method. From your point of view, from a beginner's point of view, the only interesting observation we can make here is the result 
of these things is that the CPI tends, on the whole, especially this one, to be lower than the RPI. Why? Well, just looking at the way that calculation is done, the last point on my slide there, if, this is the Office of National Statistics, statistics, if you like, if you were to take two items, one increases 25% in price and another falls by 20% over the same period, and you start from a base of 100 when looking to sort of set an index, if you use the RPI's way of calculating the average price change, you end up with a small increase. Now, this is not a maths video, so don't worry too much about the detail if you're, if you're not interested. But the point being, the RPI's method gives you a small price change, 2.5%, whereas the CPI method doesn't. And a lot of people would say that the CPI is technically more correct. And the reason is, is this. If you start off with, say, £100, all right, a 25% increase would take you up to £125. To get back to £100, you need to now lose 20% of what you have. And if you do, you're back to £100, if you see what I mean. And that's the CPI's logic. It's called, in fancy terms, a geometric mean. All right? Net result, the CPI tends to be a lower number than the RPI, which does upset people if their wage settlements, for example, are linked to the CPI rather than the RPI, for obvious reasons. So, quick look at how that looks over time. All right, there's your CPI number running over about the last 10 years. There's 2004, there's 2014. All right, and there's your RPI number as a comparison. Now, just to make the point there, the CPI number is generally below the RPI number. You can see that with one quite big exception. So, rules are there to be broken. You can see a big dive in the RPI around about the time of the credit crunch. Why? Because don't forget the RPI includes those mortgage interest payments. Those fell off a cliff when the Bank of England uh, slashed rates to the bone in response to the credit crisis. So there was a time when the RPI was tracking below the CPI. But normally, when you look it, look it up in newspapers and so on, it's the CPI that's below the RPI. And that's just worth bearing in mind. Why it matters? OK, who cares? Well, the CPI is the headline number. It's used by the Bank of England. They have a target of 2%. Now, it's tracked quite a bit below that target recently, but their job is to maintain the level of inflation measured by the CPI at or around 2%. Recently, it's been below it. Wage settlements are often linked to inflation measures. Quite often, it's the RPI that's still used, but it may be the CPI, and obviously that does make a difference. And for investors, the consequence of inflation, the reason it matters is it erodes the value of your holdings continuously bit by bit over time. And let's just take a quick look at how. This is a sort of hidden cost of sitting in cash, for example, thinking you're safe, is the fact that inflation is eroding the value of it day in, day out. Let's just take a look at that. I'll deal with this in more detail in other videos. Let's just take three rates of inflation, a pretty low one, the bank target, two, a historic normal for the UK, and a high one of 10, and just start with 100 pounds and see what would have happened to it over 5, 15, and 25 years. And most of us are in saving and investing for the long term. So maybe it's the 25-year number we're most interested in. 2% does some damage. Bear in mind, that's a very low rate of inflation by historic terms in the UK. 5%, more like the norm since the 50s, does quite a bit of damage. All right, what I mean by that is if you were to look after 25 years at the real spending power you've got from that £100, so you take it out of the top drawer, and see what you can buy with it, is what I'm saying. It's been uh, basically hammered down to around a third of what it was worth when you started 25 years earlier. And if you take a rate of 10%, a bit aggressive you might say, but we have been there once or twice in the past, the spending power of that £100 after 25 years is significantly reduced down, in effect, almost nothing. Okay? So there it is. As a saver and investor, inflation really matters from a point of view of the way it erodes the value of your capital over time. Now, therefore, high rates of inflation are your enemy. All right, so I'm going to finish with a point about two bad alternatives. High inflation, especially where it goes into hyperinflation, bad news, okay, for several reasons. One of them, it can render money completely useless. Take an extreme case, Germany in the 1920s, Zimbabwe more recently, essentially the value of money was being destroyed so fast you effectively needed kind of a wheelbarrow of the stuff to buy a loaf of bread. 
right? And then the next day, you needed two wheelbarrows to buy the same loaf of bread. Well, that's hyperinflation. High inflation is bad news. Hyperinflation is a disaster. But do you want to see the opposite? Do you want to see falling prices? No. All right? I would argue no. And it makes stock markets and investors and so on very nervous when there's any hint of it. Deflation is where you've got falling prices for goods and services on a sustained basis. And that's bad news because it suggests wage cuts. We're not used to that. You don't go to your employer at the end of the year and negotiate a wage cut normally. All right. What it's going to tend to do, as Japan has seen over recent years, is encourage saving and holding the cash. Why would you spend money now when you know the price of what you want to buy is going to go down in six months' time? You wouldn't. You tend to save, you tend to hoard, and that makes investment for companies very difficult to plan because they can't really predict with any certainty what and when people are going to start spending money. So there it is. Inflation, key for investors. All right, key for anyone negotiating a wage rise at the end of the year. And just a word of warning about the opposite, which has been hitting the headlines recently, deflation, and some of the reasons why it quite rightly makes investors nervous.